I'm Marius Papa Eftimiu. I'm the Dean of the Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences. On behalf of the faculty, the staff, and the students in the school, I wish to welcome everyone to this 50-year uh, anniversary celebration for information and computer science at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. So I am excited to share some news that I have not shared with the fire marshal. Uh, we had more than 600 RSVPs for the event, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this number will average out over the span of the next nine to 10 hours, and we're never gonna run into issues with uh, safety and all that. Uh, but we should be anticipating something which is more or less a full house for the full event. Um, so this celebration is not really about the past, it's really about the future. It's the next 50 years, as you can see from the banners and, and, and the display. Uh, by celebrating and reflecting on the first half century of the school and the accomplishments of these first 50 years, this uh, event is really meant to foreshadow the school's accomplishments in the next 50 years and to invite everyone to be part of this journey. Uh, I want to start with three observations which have basically been the driving forces behind the design of this event, and hopefully we all agree on these three points, and then we're gonna move on with the main event. So here's the three observations. Uh, observation number one, uh, and I will tell you these three observations, and, 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 and hopefully by the end of the day you will convince that ICS is really positioned to, to lead in all three of these areas. Observation number one, uh, computing will continue transforming the world around us. There is no doubt, I think, in anyone's mind that computing technologies have done a ton of things in the previous 50 years. They will do even more in the next 50 years. So uh, being able to lead in terms of research breakthroughs in the area of computing, computing is vital for the future. Now, ICS has been doing this for 50 years now. It has strengths in areas that have been strong and well known before they became uh, you know, the cover story in the New York Times, machine learning has been around in the, on this campus for 30 or 40 years. Other core areas of computing have been really strong at UCI for a long time now. But uh, there is also strength in the area of applications, interdisciplinary foundations, and interest on how inter information technology interacts with humans at all levels has been one of the uh, basic ingredients of the school from, from the get-go. Uh, observation number two, uh, computing has direct, broad, and sometimes uh, unpredictable impact on humans and society. Uh, so it's not what we, many of us, romantically, uh, you know, remember as a curiosity, an interesting thing that we did with another 10 or 20 students in the classroom that was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, computing is everywhere. It has deep societal and ethical implications. Uh, it transcends disciplines. Uh, domain experts who are also versed on the basics of computing are becoming the new norm. So if you're educating the next generation of, of informed uh, uh, citizens, uh, you cannot simply have them be domain experts. They also need to have some foundational elements in, in computing. So ICS has been sensitized to these questions and addresses them through diversity in research and academic programs that span a broad spectrum from statistics and computer science to the human-facing side of computing and informatics. Third observation, computing is an engine of social mobility. It's not only the technology that transforms the world, it also transforms the people who uh, are participants in, in, in this space. Uh, there is an uh, enormous source of professional opportunity for those who are in computing, and ICS is committed to inclusive excellence. And that has been the case for the school from its inception, and it continues to be one of the top priorities of the school, involving as many talented and hardworking individuals as it gets into the discipline of computing, because it really transforms, transforms not just the world around us, it transforms uh, the livelihoods uh, of, of individuals. So these are the three observations in mind. We've put together a day-long extravaganza featuring ICS alumni, faculty, students who will present cutting-edge research, highlight the school's impact over the years, look into the crystal ball to predict what lies ahead and how ICS is positioned to lead in the next 50 years. 
Speaking of the event, will be a session of rapid-fire TED-style talks. The intent is to energize the room. I see as researchers on cutting-edge work underway in the school, talking about cutting-edge work underway in the school. The session is entitled Making a Difference, or alternatively, in my mind, the future today. Uh, talks in this session will highlight research in data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all the things you always wanted to know everything about. But they also highlight work on cybersecurity that bridges technology with law and policy. Also work on explorations on the impact of computing on learning and emerging phenomena such as gaming and esports. So this is the late morning session. Start with, uh, lunch will start at 12.30. It's going to be outside and in one of the rooms. Uh, you will be faced with a big dilemma at 12.30. Either stay here so that you don't lose your seats to the next wave of people who come in. Or go out and get lunch and enjoy a fabulous uh, talk uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, Dr. Pedro Domingos, uh, an ICS alum first and foremost, and also professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Washington, will talk to, uh, to, to us about the five tribes of machine learning. So very exciting stuff for those who want to learn even more about machine learning. Uh, the afternoon will feature three one-hour panels, starting at 2 o'clock, one hour per panel. The first panel will give us some interesting historical context arguing that ICS was ahead of its time from the get-go, anticipating the disciplinary impact of computing and adopting a forward-looking inclusive perspective all the way from the beginning. That's, that's a very important piece of information. Second panel highlights how ICS has shaped the world around us through accomplishments of alarms in industry and the entrepreneurial activities of ICS alumni and faculty. That's gonna be happening at three o'clock. Four o'clock, the third panel takes a look at what lies ahead. So another group of alums and faculty will uh, look into the crystal ball and they will assess how computing will continue further transforming our society, enabling wide ranging advances that range from healthcare to the performing arts, while at the same time giving rise to critical questions and challenges related to fairness, uh, inclusivity, as information technology permeates every facet of human life, from recruiting new employees, applying for loans, law enforcement, the function of our democracy. So that's gonna be a very interesting forward-looking panel at four o'clock. Early evening, after a short break, there's gonna be food during the break. That's another important detail. I don't think we say that in the program, but there will be food from five to 5.45, but then the grand finale starts at 5.45. Following remarks from, uh, by Chancellor Gilman, who will be joining the celebration in the early evening, uh, Vincent Steckler, another ICS, prominent ICS alum and CEO of uh, the leading cybersecurity software firm, Avast Software, will be giving the keynote for the event starting at around 5.45 or 6 o'clock. His talk will be on the meaning and value of an ICS education. The short version of that talk is entitled From, from ICS to, you, to IPO, you'll see what this is all about. Uh, okay, we say the best for last, and I will be out of here in literally one minute because the TED Talks are starting at 11.30, and I see 11.30 up there. The best for last, our celebration will complete with a showcase of research projects by our doctoral students. Uh, they will be showcasing projects, I think it's at least a dozen. This is a fluid list that has been, well, we had, we had to, commit to a list by last night because I think I had to go to the printers. But it's at least a dozen projects that you see here. There may be more out there once you go out there in the evening. Ranging from, and I'm just sampling from what I see in front of me, from AI and biomedicine to data analytics, uh, meeting Asterix DB, Cloudberry, visualization, multimodal knowledge-based embeddings. It gets more and more exciting. Uh, if you wonder how a computer can solve, uh, can learn to solve Rubik's Cube, you should go outstairs and check out that demo as well. Uh, I think that's all I have. I really, really need to give this podium up because there's more exciting and interesting speakers uh, uh, on the way. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I look forward to a memorable and inspiring celebration of the school's next 50 years. Uh, I would now like to invite to the podium Professor Andre Vanderhoek, Chair of the Department of Informatics, who will kick off the first session of our event with our TED Talks. Andre, it's all yours.
So good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure also to welcome everybody to this session. Um, TED Talks, we all know what TED Talks are like. They are short. We all know what faculty are like who are going to give the TED Talks. <laughs> they like to talk. So, so my job really is to get out of the way as much as I can, but just to warn the faculty, of a variety of devices are installed on stage that will help with the seven minute limit. Um, so, so um, I'm just gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna invite up on stage Professor Mimi Ito, who's a professor in residence shared between anthropology and informatics. She holds the MacArthur Foundation Chair in Digital Media and Learning, is the director of the Connected Learning Lab, and specializes in learning and new media, particularly among young people. There we go. Did you know <laughs> that nearly half of undergraduates in colleges and universities around the country uh, show very little learning gains in their first two years of college? This is according to research by Richard Aram, who is our dean over in education and also a faculty member at our Connected Learning Lab uh, at ICS. So Richard, together with his colleague, Josip Orozco, uh, administered the collegiate learning assessment to freshmen and sophomores in a diverse range of colleges and universities across the country and found this rather disturbing fact. Uh, now, we hope and we do believe that this statistic does not apply to our undergraduates here at UC Irvine. Uh, but at the Connected Learning Lab, we are committed to not only investigating problems of learning, but also designing solutions. And we look in particular to social network, digital and interactive media like games and online communities as ways of really supporting learning that is genuinely student-centered, that's engaged, that's socially connected, that's meaningful, and importantly, that expands opportunity for young people in all walks of life. So I'll introduce our work uh, through a story about one of uh, the young learners that we encountered through our research and development. So Tal, at the time that we spoke to her, was 11 years old. She was passionate about Minecraft, which is a game that hopefully you all have heard of, a very interesting uh, networked uh, game that has a lot of creative elements to it. Uh, and like a lot of kids, she learned about Minecraft first in her home environment, and she played Minecraft with her cousin. Uh, but because uh, Tal is, was attending an uh, interesting school that embraced digital and game-based learning, she felt empowered to advocate for a Minecraft club after school at her school, and so she was able to bring her interest into the school environment. Uh, she was also, at the same time, continuing to engage in Minecraft at home, and like most Minecraft kids, she was watching a ton of YouTube videos on the internet, and she decided that she wanted to try creating her own. So she brought this idea back to her after-school club, and they started creating Minecraft YouTube videos. Uh, so because, again, this was a school that embraced uh, these forms of digital learning, her teachers took note, and not only did they encourage uh, this kind of activity after school, they also recognized her as a young scriptwriter. Her videos got uh, featured in the newspaper, and she started writing in other arenas, like for the school newspaper, with encouragement from her teachers at school. So Tal is an example of what we call a connected learner, a learner that has a passionate interest. In her case, it was Minecraft. Uh, she's pursuing that interest with supportive relationships, both peers who share that interest as well as caring adults who are supportive. And then the last piece of the connected learning uh, uh, um, circle is that those social, those informal learning uh, experiences are connected to opportunity to achieve things at school and eventually we hope career and civic engagement as well. So the moral of the story of Tal is not that the internet or Minecraft creates connected learners, but in fact it doesn't without a supportive environment of adults who are engage with young people's interests, who are attentive to what they're doing, and making those connections between young people's social and fun stuff that they're doing, the creative stuff they're doing outside of school, and the kinds of things that will matter for them to find their way in the grown-up world. So the more typical thing we see, and we've interviewed thousands of young people, thousands of digital kids, is that they actually struggle to connect 
what they're doing at home uh, and for fun with what they're doing at school. And most kids actually have interest, and a lot of them are geeking out on their interests on the internet just like Tal is, uh, but most uh, young people do not find ways of connecting those interests. Now, this is ironic and somewhat tragic because we're actually in an era of absolute abundance when it comes to access to information, to knowledge, to social connection, to specialized communities of interest. But because our institutions of education were founded in an era that didn't um, assume this abundance, we're really struggling to figure out how can we best provide this connective tissue even though that knowledge and that social connectivity is actually there. There. And this is really the work that we're trying to do at the Connected Learning Lab, is to understand these dynamics, how technology is changing how young people learn, but also figuring out ways to empower educators, parents, young people, technology makers to build a genuinely connected ecosystem of learning that is key to today's network world. So connected learning is not only a way of describing a kind of learning that the research has shown over and over again is the most meaningful, efficacious, motivating, life-changing kinds of learning that young people can have when they're doing something that they care deeply about with people who are supporting them and connecting them to opportunity. We know this is the best kind of learning that all young people deserve, but we're also trying to develop ways of informing educators and designers of sort of principles that can guide how you design, how you support, how you enable environments that foster that kind of learning. So I'll close with just a couple examples. Uh, one is a school called Quest to Learn that was founded in 2009, a middle school through high school. And in fact, Tal was a student at Quest to Learn. So this is an example of a school that was designed uh, to meet young people where they are in their interests in gaming and connect those interests to academic achievement. And then one more example uh, is another, um, another project. Actually, Katie Salen, who is a member of our lab, founded Quest to Learn, and she was also co-founder with me of a nonprofit called Connected Camps, where we're providing hands-on project-based learning uh, experiences online in games like Minecraft and using open online learning platforms like Scratch. So those are just two examples of the work that we're pursuing at the Connected Learning Lab. You'll have an opportunity to hear from some of our, um, from Constance, who is also part of our lab and doing some other fabulous work in connected learning. I should also let you know, she's off to San Diego to another event right now. Um, so <laughs> um, I would like to invite our second speaker, Constance Steinkuller, who's a professor in informatics. Um, she's the lead faculty of the UCI eSports Research Lab. She's also a former senior policy analyst in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, advising on games and digital media. Uh, she specializes in cognitive and social aspects of multiplayer online video games and eSports. Please. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I love going after Mimi because I feel like I can just say, and now here's just another example. I work in the Connected Learning Lab. I'm also a new faculty in informatics. Esports. How many of you actually know anything about esports? If you're on UCI campus, you should. Um, esports has become, in the last two or three years, a juggernaut on the industry. Imagine sports where it's cerebral, it's thoroughly connected and technological, as much as it is corporeal as well. Um, in the last couple years, we've seen this huge spike in the states, although esports have been around essentially competitive video game play for, I don't know, almost a decade now. In fact, back in the early days when I was in arcades, there was still competitive gameplay, but now you can do it on a global scale. So if you look at viewership alone, we're talking about the watching of matches of competitive video game play. We saw a 43% increase in two years alone. Compare that to the increase in global revenues, you see a 439% I'm sorry, 239 increase in that same two-year period. So not only has uh, participation in esports increased, but the spectating audience has massively increased in the amount of investment and spending in this area. Of course, UCI is considered, in fact, we just won the award for the top program in esports. 2011 was the first time we saw esports as a collegiate kind of club on campuses. By 2016, UCI opened their doors to the first arena that is on our campus that's over near the student center. 
Now there are more than 90 programs in higher ed, including Ivy League, like UC Berkeley, UCLA, and others, that offer, that not only have esports programs, collegiate programs, but that offer scholarships to students to come to school on esports. So it has been massively rising. There. Um, and I have to brag because we won the world championship in League of Legends, which is a super hard thing to do. Right? Yeah, we have a great program. Now, I wish I could take credit for that. I'm actually more on the academic side. One thing, our program, why we won the best program award was not simply because our team can compete well. It's also because we have been sort of national leaders in setting policies around diversity, around inclusion, around what a program at a college, higher ed university ought to look like. Now, I work on the pillar of academics and research. I run a lab that we call the eSports Research Lab. Really, we're just a small group of ragtag people, me and my doctoral students, a postdoc or two, working within the Connected Learning Lab. Um, and we study, first, individual gameplay. We look at things like cognition and their attitudes toward games, efforts like tilt when you start making emotional decisions and your, let's say, your risk-taking increases in a way that may not be good for your play. We look at team aspects, so how, do, how does a team in an eSport, a team that's playing a game together as a squad of five, how do they regulate their attention? How do they manage the amount of information that they have to manage in order to be able to compete well and coordinate? We also look at the overall ecosystem. It turns out that if you broaden the lens and look at eSports more as an ecosystem, there is a ton of interesting talent involved in eSports. It's just like basketball. For every one player on the court, there are literally hundreds of people behind the scenes making that happen. So you have people in the area of strategists doing theory crafting, coaches. You have content creators, including all sorts of media. You have entrepreneurs building second services. And you've got organizers and event planners. Well, as we started studying this ecosystem, one thing we noticed was that there were all of these sort of nuggets and kernels of activities that we looked at and we saw them very much as important knowledge and skills. Not just important knowledge and skills, but specifically knowledge and skills that tie to all the academic standards, say for example in high school, that we want students to accomplish. Now this is very interesting and not a new pattern. I've spent the last 15 years looking at how it is that kids will spend incredible amounts of cognitive effort and, and sheer sort of uh, cognitive sort of work in their play spaces, in fact paying in order to be able to do it, whereas in school they're sort of disconnected and feel like they're not, they're not really, you know, investing in the same way. So my biggest question has always been, how can we take this passion and love around their interest and engage them in some of these big ideas that we know are important for society? So we asked in this case, how can we formalize and amplify some of that important knowledge and skills for kids? We know from the last decade of research that games in the right context can be incredible catalysts for learning. It also turns out that sports, especially for young people in middle and high school, sports has a really interesting positive effect on staying in school, on increased GPA and resilience. Even in areas like women in STEM, women who participate in sports will show more uh, persistence in STEM careers when they have nothing to do with the sport that they play, right? So if you put together games and sports, you end up with eSports. So we put together a network of local leaders and created what we call the North America Scholastic eSports Federation. That's a mouthful. We just call it NASAF. Now, in its first incarnation, this actually had 25 schools and 38 teams, all from Orange County. We just launched it nationally. We have over 100, 100 uh, schools that we're serving across the entire U.S. in our first year of launch alone. The main model behind this is that we are focusing not just on the team at the center, but again on that entire ecosystem of activity and leveraging that as a way to engage kids in a club around a sport that they love and use it to seed STEM, ISTE, and other standards in their work. And of course, you know, our first year showed that in fact the findings are strong. We show impact in areas like academic skills, the ability to analyze their own data, um, we see spontaneous creation of things like media production, websites, and the like, increased communication skills, 
actual increased uh, attendance and motivating homework, finishing their homework, because our club requires that you have to maintain a certain GPA to stay in, and uh, social emotional learning, which was a real surprise for many of us. It turns out that for many kids, it was the first time they realized that not tilting and not being toxic online was actually a way to improve your team. It's hard to play well if you can't play as a team. So this next year, the study we're in now is actually looking at a quasi-experimental study. So we're going to compare kids in the league to kids not in the league at the same schools to see whether or not these effects endure when we do a comparison. Now you'll notice here I say, you know, studying students, their peer network, teachers, and parents. That parents one seems like an odd one, right? Well, it turns out that one thing we saw as well was that we weren't just, we weren't just sort of impacting the kids that were involved in the clubs. We actually were impacting the teachers, coaches, and parents that they were involved with. And I picked out a piece of data from some of our studies where this is a kid at the end of our league at the championship event. We talked to this young man about how, the, how, uh, how playing in esports in the league that was high school associated, how did that shape their home life? And you'll see this child commented, I think it's changed my relationship with my parents a lot. Most of the time, we'd be watching sports, my dad would be watching sports, and he wouldn't start conversations with me unless he needed to know something about his phone or something like that. And now it's more like us conversing while watching those Let's Plays. That's an eSport kind of uh, video. I've been introducing him to some YouTubers and things like that, showing him how Twitch works. I think we've been more connected. So creating these spaces, it's not just that we're connecting kids to important academic standards. It's also that we're building out this ecosystem of really important mentoring, adult, caring relationships that might continue to amplify the work that we're doing. So thank you for your time. Did I make time? No. We're one for two so far, so, but we'll continue. Is there a quick question people want to ask? I love it. Um, I will say, so I've studied cognition my whole life. I've never really studied sports. So really, the sports frame that this brings to the discussion of video games has been really provocative in the fact that for the first time ever, I can say something to students that's like, look, if you don't eat well, sleep well, and get workouts, then you're actually not going to be very good at the game. Because it turns out, if you look at professional esports players, they have physical therapists, they have team psychologists, including the team on our campus does. So what's so interesting about this is that I know that from the outside it may seem like, oh, this isn't like a physical sport. It's a, actually a very physical sport when you think about what's demanding on your body. And so what's interesting about esports is that that sports frame brings in a way for someone like me to say, yeah, actually sleep matters and you're getting worse. I can show kids you are actually playing worse because you're not getting enough sleep and nutrition. So it's become this very interesting sort of vehicle for those conversations. In the past, it hasn't been so successful. Usually, they consider like regulating screen time something you do for small children, right? So for the first time, I can be like, or it's going to make you awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Constance is also escaping, but she's going to teach them 300 students about all this stuff right now. So in a single class. Yes, th those are the numbers we got these days. Um, but she will be back later, right? Yes. So. There's lots of questions I bet many of you have. Um, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Brian Cunningham. He's the executive director of the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute here at UCI. Um, <laughs> you can guess where this talk is going to go. Um, he's the former White House lawyer, another White House person, senior CIA officer, federal prosecutor, um, worked closely with the 9-11 Commission, um, which I thought was very interesting, and more. He specializes particularly in cybersecurity law and policy. Thank you. Good morning. As Andre said, I'm not only an academic, but I'm also a lawyer, which means I can't say anything in seven minutes, but I will do my best. Anybody know who that is? OK, no time for the Socratic method. I'll just tell you. That is Miguel and Tulio from the 2000 DreamWorks film, The Road to El Dorado. They are running from an evil Aztec warlord, and one of them uh, is much more fearful than the other. And Tulio says to Miguel, you worry too much. Miguel says, no. I worry the exact amount, exact right amount. You know why? Because you can never worry too much. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the message in cybersecurity for the next decade or so. There are at least four macro trends that we see coming together 
that are creating one of the most, I think, dangerous times from a national and economic security standpoint in my lifetime, and I'm barely old enough to have been alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis, so I count that as part of that assessment. First of all, it's estimated by 2025 there will be one trillion, with a T, connected devices. In 2016, some of the most massive, what we call denial of service attacks, were launched, taking down the internet in the entire country of Liberia for a day or two, and crippling all of our social media sites on the east coast of the United States. That atta those attacks were using, taking over and using for the attack something like five to 600,000 devices. Now, if I could do math, I probably would be something else than a lawyer, but if you do the math, trillion sounds like a lot more to me. So the computing power that can be taken over and harnessed and used for evil, as well as good, is going to exponentially increase. Secondly, you now have uh, rogue regimes and dictators and organized criminal groups and individuals around the world who can put in their hands the power to cause damage that only first world militaries had a couple of years ago. Now, I don't know who I might be talking about. Um, <laughs> this, by the way, is my screensaver, uh, <laughs> just, to, just to keep us focused on priorities. Um, I, put, I put Kim up there not only because of the current threat that he represents, and I don't want to get political, but I'm not betting a lot of money that we'll get a verifiable treaty with him, but because he is the paradigm today of a, a rogue leader with immense power, even in a country that can barely get hydraulic uh, power to the second floor of their hotels, um, who is willing to do anything. And I think I might have missed it. No, I must have lost a slide or else they're out of order. Because um, example two, there we go. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Now. I would not be surprised, and by the way, I was an intelligence officer for a very long time in my first uh, life, my first career, I was a KGB analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency. And I never thought those skills would come in handy again, but it seems like they may be relevant now. I wouldn't be surprised to wake up one day and see that the Russian Duma, the legislature, had voted him czar. And what he's proving, and what Kim's proving, and what apparently the Saudis just proved over the last uh, 96 hours is that they are, do not feel constrained by any laws of armed conflict, international laws, international norms, and they are willing and able to use computing power to achieve their aims. Third thing, our government is unwilling and or unable to do much of anything about it. We've proven that we can't or won't push back on Putin. 85 to 90 percent of all the critical infrastructure in the country is in the hands of the private sector but the relationship between the government and the private sector is exceedingly weak, almost non-existent in some cases, and so we're on our own. Now, I will mention uh, a ray of hope. Uh, I'm not gonna say too much about the Institute here because I don't have time, I'll be around all day, but we are multidisciplinary, and that's very important. And in, as part of our research, working with cultural anthropologists, we learned that cyber threats are actually much older than we thought. Sorry about that, I had to get that one in. So, as I was trying to think of a metaphor for how to look at the situation today and in the coming decade, I came upon this oldie timey map of the Caribbean and you'll see like many of the maps of that era, there's just a sea monster, a giant sea monster drawn in the middle of the Caribbean. Now, I don't believe that the map makers of that time actually thought there were giant sea serpents in the Caribbean. You'll see some of these maps, I couldn't find one, but some of them would have the legend here there be monsters. And I think the message they were trying to convey was you go out here and we don't know what's there and you're on your own and we can't protect you. And so what we want to try to do is avoid this. Last metaphor. I was trying to think through a situation where so much of our national and economic security and I would say global economic security is actually in the hands of private enterprise, in this case, of chief information security officers and their staffs uh, at, at companies, because they're the ones that have to fight these attacks, not only against their own data and their own uh, customers, but also to take over their devices and use them for other attacks. And all of you, I'm sure, know this is a picture of Dunkirk, 
uh, and most, I'm sure everyone knows the story, but the British Army, 400,000 of them were trapped by the Nazis, almost certain to be annihilated by aircraft, and the British had no navy to pull them off that they could get there in time. So they put out the call, and some, something like four to 5,000 ships, private boats, yachts, rowboats, probably not rowboats, but private ships went over and rescued those guys. And this is where I think we are, that we have to, as citizens, and as people working in this field, take matters into our own, own hands. Now, a cynic would say that now that I'm an academic, I only have to identify problems. I don't actually have to solve them. <laughs> so if I run out of time, that's, that I'm not going to get into any more of the solutions than I have time for. But let me just tell you about a couple things that the university is doing through us at the CPRI and through other resources. First, uh, last year, the chancellor and the provost approved two new full-time cybersecurity faculty positions in ICS. Those positions have been filled. Very excited about that. Secondly, we in ICS look at cybersecurity across the entire spectrum from biodiversity-inspired computer compiler security to hardware network security to IoT and cyber physical system securities, on and on and on to our role, the policy and legal consequences and issues related to cybersecurity. We take a multidisciplinary approach, as I said, and we're expanding our horizons. We're staffing up. We now have a fellow, April Sather, who will be around all day to keep the trains running on time, which I'm fully uh, incapable of. Um, we have, uh, in September of 2019, with the support of the state of California and the United States Commercial Service, we're going to lead a trade delegation to Singapore of Orange County cybersecurity uh, companies. And I can't say much about this right now, but watch our space. In the coming weeks, we're about to announce a major new grant program that's going to have two long-term research projects that directly go to the problems I've identified today. Thank you. All right, so next up is Hal Stern, Chancellor's Professor of Statistics. Uh, he's also the founding chair of statistics and served uh, formerly as our dean for our school. He specializes in Be Bayesian statistical methodology and model assessment techniques. Um, so I'm going to talk about data, data science. Uh, it's so important that actually the next three presentations, mine and two more, are all around data, so they can correct anything I get wrong. I have up here a few quotes, but I want to draw your attention to the book on the left there, The Fourth Paradigm, which I found really fantastic. It dates back about a decade, a little more than that, and gets its title from a talk that Jim Gray of Microsoft gave in which he characterized data as the fourth paradigm of science. It started with empirical observation hundreds of years ago, people watching the planets go by, and then it was a bit aided by theory as we developed the theory and understood why things happen. And as systems got bigger and got beyond our theory abilities, computation played a role in simulation. And then data has now emerged as the key to generating knowledge and understanding what's happening in the world around us. So that data science is one term, you'll hear several, that has emerged as kind of the capture this notion of the importance of data. Uh, not everyone agrees on the definition of data science, but the high points are in this slide. It brings together tools from mathematics and statistics on the one hand, computer science on the other, and critically, some application domain, many application domains, everything you've heard about, education, cybersecurity, all have a need for data science tools. And then I have on a, a list of the many things that happen and important for us today, they all happen in ICS. And so data science is a critical space for us. What I'd like to do is just quickly run through a couple of examples. Data science, somewhat related to the idea of big data. Big data is not a popular term anymore because it turns out data doesn't have to be that big to be interesting. There's complexity, there are different kinds. So I have three examples. The first is healthcare. Uh, as most people know, all of the health records are becoming electronic, and there's this hope that there's this holy grail. The University of California has 14 million records among its hospitals, and that if we just look there, we'll find all the answers to health care. This is a little comic study that's a caricature of that. It's a doctor I work with who studies prostate cancer, and you're not supposed to read that table. That's just a standard medical journal table that says we've compared people who got surgery for prostate cancer, radiation, and another group that was watchful waiting. And they're, in this case, looking at quality of life three years down the line. And you'll notice that they had surgery and radiation seem to have the same effect on sexual function. But these studies are hard. They, the three groups they compared differ in lots of ways. And it turns out that the patients who got radiation were sicker than the patients who got surgery, 
were sicker than the patients who were just watchful waiting. And you must, must take account of that, and it's not so easy to figure out how. In this instance, a couple of approaches have been tried, and they all agree that, in fact, radiation is better in terms of preserving sexual function than surgery, even though the raw data on the first slide showed you that they looked about the same. So really critical to bring in the analytical tools in addition to the large amounts of data. A second area of application, one that I'm spending a lot of time on personally these days, is about justice. And this brings up a second feature of data. The first example was kind of about volume, one of the big Vs that people talk about. This is really about variety. In court, we often see data, doesn't look like data, there's no numbers here, um, like this, right? This fingerprint found at the crime scene and this fingerprint belonging to the suspect, are they the same person or not? It turns out there's a lot of evidence generated over the last decade or so. There are a couple of quotes here, a couple of examples. This type of evidence has been used in court, fingerprints going back more than 100 years, shoe prints and blood stain pattern analysis and a variety of others for the last 20, 30, 50 years. Um, but we don't know how good they are. How well do people identify fingerprint pairs or shoe print pairs? The National Academy of Science said, we don't know. The Innocence Project has found out that many people have been convicted on seemingly matching evidence that turned out not to match. And so we're part at UCI of a $20 million research center that's trying to come up with new methods to take a question like this. The signature that has a Q next to it is at issue in the case. The signatures below it are four known genuine signatures of this person. Did Ms. Garcia write that signature? How do we answer that? Our research center is trying to do that. I won't tell you about this, but there are issues of how do we reduce the data, get information out, compare the distance between known matches and known non-matches, and use that. The third example I want to mention is some research that's going on here at UCI that studies how mothers play with their children and the long-term impacts of that. And some of the interesting, some of the most interesting data they collected was 10-minute videos of mothers playing with their children. And they came to us and they said, we think that the maternal predictability is key. Well, how do you get that out of a video? It's a complicated sequence with several students involved, but we recorded what the mother did. Did she talk to the child? Did she touch the child? And how predictable were those transitions? Did the child know that the mom's going to show me a toy and then talk to me and then hold me? Or was it unpredictable? And through that, we get a measure here at the bottom, the entropy rate, which is like a continuous trait in our population of maternal predictability. And what I find amazing, the picture on the bottom left here is from a paper. The horizontal axis is predictability. The less predictable the mother, going from that side to this side, the vertical axis is how the child does on a mental test at two years of age. And there's a real association here. And it persists. The same picture would hold if we looked at how the children did in school at five years or nine years. And the question is, why and what's going on? So the last thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is the terminology. There is a lot of buzzwords going around. Statistics, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, all of them are about helping the world make sense of data, and the message that I go around trying to tell people is, these are not competitors, these are allies, these are friends. These are a continuum of methods, and the best method depends on the task. If it's computer vision, it's a prediction problem. In the science study I did, there are mechanistic questions. So the right tool depends on the task at hand, and we were asked to think about the future ICS incredibly well situated because of our combination of CS, informatics, and statistics. I had a colleague visiting from Harvard last week to give us a seminar. She said, UCI was genius to put statistics next to computer science. How did, how did they think of that? Um, and we're trying to take advantage of that. We have a degree in data science, a bachelor's degree. Uh, we have PhDs for a long time in both statistics and computer science and in informatics with expertise in these skills. And the missing piece that we're trying to add, that's a fingers crossed there. Uh, we have a master's degree proposal that's in review. We hope to launch a professional master's degree in 2019. So the data is your future. Thank you. And the option for a question. All right, so Hal's also off to teach.
I don't know how many students, but it's got to be a lot again. Um, so he also will be back um, later, later today. So our next speaker will be Alex Eiler. Uh, he's an associate professor in computer science. He's a recipient of what's called an NSF Career Award, which is highly prestigious. Um, multiple Best Papers Awards at lots of premier conferences. And so he specializes in AI and machine learning. So we're going to get a little more of the same, but quite different. There's a whole bunch of us, yeah. Now I feel like this is almost a dare. Like, how long do I have to talk before Andre charges up here and <laughs> tackles me off the stage? Um, so I'm really pleased to be here um, representing AI and machine learning. Um, it's, uh, it's been really um, exciting time for AI and machine learning and a little bit surreal as well. Uh, so I've seen uh, machine learning and AI go from an intellectual, interesting research topic to uh, something that's now in my news feed every day. Um, it's it's uh, a little bit um, strange, but it's also very exciting to see all the ways that machine learning is now impacting uh, not just technology, but also uh, jobs and business, um, defense, security, um, environment, and many, many more places. Um, so machine learning actually has a long history here at Irvine, um, going back 30 to 40 years, I think Marios mentioned, um, and has had a huge impact on the field, uh, in part just because of uh, back more than 30 years ago, some students and faculty made something called the Machine Learning Repository um, to contain data sets uh, that they hope to use for evaluating models and doing comparisons between methods. And this has had a massive impact as everyone for the last 30 years has used it. Um, people have developed competitions from it, so um, inheritors of this kind of approach are things like the Netflix $1 million challenge, which uh, Professor Porrick Smith was a judge for, um, Yelp, which has ongoing challenges, which uh, Professor Samir Singh uh, has won an iteration of, and systems like Kaggle that we use for competitions and data problems for our classes. Um, so over those 30 years, machine learning and AI has, has uh, had massive growth here at Irvine. Uh, we now have about a dozen faculty working in different areas of machine learning and AI as their core research. Um, we've seen tremendous growth in our classes. So this blue line is my class. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed it a little more back then, but it's, uh, it's gratifying to see just how many people want to take it. We have multiple undergraduate tracks and uh, majors that involve machine learning and data science. We have undergraduate clubs that are focused on AI. and. All our PhD alumni are going off and starting their own groups at academic institutions or working on technology and industrial research in, in different uh, industry companies. So many of us are focused on uh, problems that are kind of core tasks for building intelligent systems. Um, so we have research going on in computer vision and image understanding and image processing. Um, in natural language processing, both comprehension models and um, uh, text-to-speech uh, text or speech synthesis problems. And I'll just uh, highlight some in planning. So this is a former student, uh, Yuten Chen, uh, who went off and joined DeepMind. And this, he sent us this picture. Um, he was on the AlphaGo team and sent us that from China as uh, AlphaGo was defeating the world champion at Go, KG, uh, three to zero. Um, so it was really exciting to sort of see this in the news and then get this email from him that he's uh, participating in it. And then you can see uh, Pierre Baldi's demo of um, his Rubik's Cube solver, which is built also on deep learning uh, heuristic methods um, uh, outside. Um, another key part is to do interdisciplinary work. So many of us also work on uh, problems involving other departments. Uh, so this is work that my lab did on precipitation est estimation from remote sensing. Um, and uh, Eric Sutter's lab did work on seismic monitoring around the world using Bayesian models to estimate uh, earthquakes and also nuclear tests, which cause seismic activity. Um, some of us are working with physics to improve their data pipelines. So Pierre Baldi in um, doing work in high energy physics and one of my students doing work in astronomy on improving their data processing to do better detection problems. And uh, Hal already mentioned uh, the Forensics Institute where uh, people like Charles Faux are doing computer vision work, but applied to analyzing uh, shoe print or fingerprint analysis. Um, it's also important to try to incorporate humans into the process. This is a huge area in machine learning these days as we try to get a grip on how learning systems and people can interact in a way that they feel confident of things. 
So, um, so my lab has been doing a lot of work on crowdsourcing. Um, so crowdsourcing is a task where instead of taking expert information, uh, you take a large number of amateur info. So you get uh, amateurs to answer questions for you, and then you use a machine learning model to try to aggregate these and understand what your uh, non-experts are doing with the system. Um, so by taking multiple experts, you can try to figure out which of them are better at the task and try to figure out what the true answers are. So this has um, important applications, both in getting data for machine learning, but also in cognitive science and analyzing data for peer review or peer grading. Um, and then at the other end, the flip side of that is taking the output of the model and letting the output of the model interact with humans. And Samir Singh's group has been working on tasks in explainable learning, where the output of the model is not sufficient. Instead, you want the model to output a full explanation of what's going on so that it can try to um, assure the user of, of its veracity and try to um, uh, be usable by that, by that expert is part of a larger decision process. It's also useful in uh, biased systems. So we're looking for uh, bias in, for instance, um, uh, machine learning for justice or uh, for hiring decisions or other things. Like there was a story recently about Amazon ditching their machine learning system for hiring because of bias. So um, in summary, it's an exciting time to be in machine learning, especially here at Irvine. Um, we have ties both throughout ICS and uh, in departments across the campus. Um, we're growing in education. Um, students are very excited by the area. We have research both in core AI and um, touching research across the campus. Um, and we're building on an area of strength that's been going for the department for 30, 40 years um, and uh, building larger each year, uh, both in undergrad programs, new faculty, and centers that allow us to do research across campus. Thank you. And look, yes, there's questions. Um, with quantum computing. Mm, I, I, so I think that's um, very interesting, but very speculative. I think that um, nobody's really successfully demonstrated uh, quantum computing doing very useful computing so far. Um, so uh, there are some theoretical ideas about how you can solve combinatorial problems much better, um, but uh, practically speaking, it hasn't had an impact yet. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see how things change, but I think we need to see more practical quantum computing to know anything about that. So um, I do think that there are really two main paths. One of them is, uh, is building more intelligent systems, and that's what you see in things like AlphaGo or um, the League of Legends AI player um, in the Rubik's Cube and so on. Um, and so those are just trying to answer fundamental questions of w what intelligent behavior can be. And as you solve those, you, you create opportunities for uh, robotics and robotic assistance and other things. And then the other is just connecting these things to scientific problems. And that tends to be a different skill set, um, but uh, equally important. And um, for those, you need some kind of collaboration with domain science. So our, our last speaker today is Pierre Baldi, who's been sitting on the front row just rubbing his hands in excitement because all the speakers have actually been sticking to, his to their time. That doesn't mean you get extra, all right? <laughs> so um, Pierre is a distinguished professor, the highest honor at our university for in computer science. I told you I was going to, I'm sorry. Director of the Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics, Associate Director of the Center for Machine Learning and Data Mining, um, and Spryce Price specializes in AI and machine learning. So one more. I'm going to tell you three, three things. The incredible story of ICS on Earth. ICS stands for Information and Computing Systems. The amazing contributions that students have done to this story. And I'll show you two video clips that the students have made. So we live on a very beautiful planet. And imagine an alien here from a distant galaxy, very advanced civilization, 
who is sent to Earth by his boss, and his goal, his task, is to report on the status of ICS on planet Earth. What would he say to his boss upon his return? When I ask this to my students, I get all kinds of crazy, crazy answers. But if you ask my colleagues, you'll get even more uh, crazier answers, <laughs> because each one will tell you about his own discipline, right? So here's what I think the correct answer to this question. It's a panel with four, four rectangles, if you want. And ICS is really about computing and storing information. You need those two things. On the computing side, we really have two technologies today on planet Earth. You have carbon-based computing, which is living systems, and you have silicon-based computing, which you know very well. I know there is quantum computing, DNA computing, but those are very small at this point in time. On the storage side, you have the Turing style of storing things, which is you have discrete location on some physical substrate. It could be DNA, or it could be the memory of your uh, silicon-based computers, and you store information at those addresses. But there is another way of storing information where you uh, holographically scatter information across large numbers of synapses, and this is what happens or is believed to happen in the brain. And so the amazing story goes like that. About 3.8 billion years ago, life started on planet Earth, the first self-replicating molecules, the first self-replicating cell. Every cell in your body is an incredible computer which is uh, measuring uh, the concentration of tens of thousands of molecules and adjusting the concentration of tens of thousands of molecules every second of your life. About 500 million, so this is Turing style because the information is stored uh, on, on, in the genome along the DNA, which is made of discrete letters, ACGTs, and you have very precise locations for genes and intron, exon, promoters, etc., etc. About 500 million years ago, evolution discovered the neural style of, of storing information and developed the first neurons, the first uh, neuronal circuits, and the first very primitive brains. And then over the last one million year, it has produced the human brain, which is really amazing because the human brain has started doing crazy things like self-reflecting on itself, trying to understand how it works. It has invented silicon-based computing and of course all these devices, and in this world, you see again the same trend going towards the neural style of storage. And you see this at different levels. We do AI, neural networks, etc. So we do this in software. We run things in silicon-based uh, hardware, but we're trying to emulate the neural style. And then people are building neuromorphic chips over the last 40 years. We're not there yet, but it's definitely an important trend. And so you, get, you see again this, this, this movement towards the neural style of, of uh, processing. One of the reasons is that the neural style is way more efficient from an energy standpoint. Now, along this story, some very interesting things happened here. The evolution produced a few interesting individuals. One of them is Turing, of course, who is the sort of founder of AI. And the most amazing thing is that he came up with the idea of Turing style Turing machines and Turing storage while thinking about the brain. It's completely incredible. Here are two gentlemen, McCulloch and Pitts. One of them was homeless, by the way. They came up, they started thinking about the brain, and they come up with this very simple, simplified mathematical model of a neuron. And this is what we have been using for the past eight years. This is what gives rise to neural networks, deep learning. Everything you hear today about AI, self-driving car, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a lot of it, at least, uh, AlphaGo, is using essentially this kind of device, arranging networks, and then the key problem is how do you store information in these weights? So people working in machine learning, that's, that's one of the key fundamental problems that, the, that they work on. I'm going to remove the little icons because I could keep putting icons on this image, just leave the words, and show you some of the very interesting and complex errors that are coming out. For instance, this error is what people call bioinformatics today, using silicon-based computer and machine learning and neural networks to try to better understand carbon-based computing. A lot of the students in ICS are working on this error, again, simulating neural networks on, 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 uh, on silicon-based hardware and uh, 
deriving system that can be used to understand data, to play the Rubik's Cube, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is this red arrow that I leave for the end because I think it's, uh, it's going to be very important for, for the next few years, but I leave it for the end. So examples of amazing contribution that the ICS students have done over, say, the last decades, they are all over the place. For instance, this is a very recent paper, of course, in collaboration with biologists, uh, studying carbon-based computing, identifying, building an atlas of all the molecules that are oscillating in a circadian way in different organs in a mouse. This is a, 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 a great contribution, trying to understand the neural style of storing information by understanding how certain proteins play a very important role in synaptic plasticity in the brain. Um, you can see here example of papers applying these machine learning methods, these neural networks run on, on, on silicon hardware to physics. I think uh, Alex mentioned this paper before or to chemistry, predicting chemical reactions, and of course a lot of applications, we have a lot of applications to biology, whether it's at, the, at all scales of biology, where, whether it's at genomic level, or in this case at the level of biomedical images. So let me get uh, to this arrow. Um, this arrow is very interesting, it's uh, over, it, essentially time-wise it's the last, roughly it's the last um, 100,000 years of evolution, and it's drawn backward because essentially evolution has invented the Turing style of storing things twice. It did it the first time with DNA, and it did it again in the last 100,000 years. What I'm trying to say is that over the last 100,000 years, the brain has been trying to store things that are organized dig digitally at specific uh, discrete location. That is language. That's exactly what language is if you think about it in this way. You take English, it's about 200,000 words. Those are discrete entities, and each word, you can think of it as an address that stores, that points to a pattern of ele electrical activity in the brain. The word cat evokes a pattern of ele electrical activity in your brain, and your pattern is different than mine, but we can talk. It's a shared set of addresses. And that is absolutely amazing, and I think the grand challenge for AI in the next decades, it's going to understand this. How do you get Turing storage in the brain? These addresses are, of course, themselves represented by neural activity. So you need to understand how you get addresses that are emerging inside neural hardware and that are pointing themselves to neural activity representing objects, and then how you can have a sort of algebra or way of combining these addresses, which is what symbolic processing is. So when you see work on the Rubik's Cube that was mentioned also by, <laughs> by Alex, I'm out of time. Um, this is a beginning of this path, because of course the Rubik's Cube is all about mathematics and, and uh, transformation, and so we're, we're using machine learning to try to go into that direction. I'm out of time, I'm going to show you the two videos very rapidly. Here's the Rubik's Cube video. So we have a website, Deep, uh, Deep Cube, where you can go, you can scramble the cube, uh, press solve, and it's going to get solved. Now this morning we came up with a new idea with the students. We're gonna, we could do an app where you take a scrambled cube, you take pictures from two angles, you send them to our server, and the server teaches you how to solve the scrambled cube. And then we have Google Ads or something on the side, so we make a lot of money, and Marius is gonna be happy. <laughs> now, I am the last thing standing between you and lunch, so I'm going to show a video of colonoscopy enhanced, <laughs> enhanced by AI. Don't worry, it's not, it's not too gory. So, no, I'm, I'm very serious, I'm very serious. So the way this works, you take pictures like this, where you have pictures of the colon, you see a polyp. You don't have to be a doctor to recognize a polyp. I've seen thousands of images. I can, I can pick up polyps very easily, right? So we train neural networks on these images to recognize on a given image whether there is a polyp or not. Now you tell me, that's nice, but colonoscopy is a video. What can you do with video? Well, training may take a week or two, but once it's trained, the neural network takes 20 milliseconds to process a frame. So it's no problem at all to run it on videos, and this is what you're gonna see before your lunch. The preparations were very good, so don't worry. 
So you see polyps coming in and out, and you see bounding boxes around. Those bounding boxes are produced in real time by these neural networks, by the AI. And the student who did this is Gregor Urban. You'll see him tonight, and he's, he, may, he may be here during the day, and you're more than welcome to, to, to talk to him. But it's a very interesting work. And the same thing can be done to all kinds of different uh, imaging modalities, whether it's ultrasound, X-ray, MRIs, it doesn't matter. It's, it's uh, the same technology. One second, Andre, just one sec. <laughs> okay, can we stop the video? I have one more uh, commercial here. We're going to have a little symposium on May 31st on uh, AI and biomedicine. Everyone is invited. There, there will be announcements, but I think it's, uh, we have an incredible lineup of speakers from, also from, from other universities. And uh, these are the students that have done all the work over the years, and of course, uh, we're very thankful uh, to them. Here is uh, Gregor Urban. If you want to talk to him about uh, your colon, he will be very happy. Uh, Steve McAleer, Forrest Agostinelli, uh, are the Rubik's Cube uh, masters. And I just want to point out that the students are extremely happy, as you can see in this image. <laughs> and I take no credit whatsoever for this, because I try to make their life miserable by giving them a lot of work, but they, go away, they run away to the beach all the time and do crazy things. Thank you. So while Pierre is right on a lot of things, he's not the last thing standing between you lunch. It's actually me, because um, I get to close the session. Um, two things. One is, I hope you notice that, A, we're serious about our work, but we actually have fun at it, too. Um, and I think that's an important hallmark of our school. Um, and second, um, this is a really small sliver of the kind of work that gets done in our school. You just saw six faculty. Um, there is 87 now, Mario's, um, with plans to grow further and further. So, so you saw less than 10% of what happens, um, and there's so much more uh, to explore. So thank you for, for sitting through these TED Talks. Thank you for everybody actually getting us done in exactly an hour. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>